9 Unsolved Mysteries That Have Finally Been Cracked We've covered more than a few unsolved mysteries out here. There's an exhilaration in trying to piece together clues that have eluded detectives over the years. Some of the unsolved mysteries that puzzled us a few years ago aren't mysteries anymore. Today, we're going to revisit those mysteries and find out how the pieces came together when they were solved. 9. Lori Ruff's True Identity A six-year investigation into the true identity of a woman who called herself Lori Erica Ruff has finally yielded answers. In 2010 the mystery woman took her own life, leaving behind two suicide notes, which authorities at the time said were ramblings from a clearly disturbed person. Following her death, caused by a self-inflicted gunshot wound, her husband Blake Ruff learned the woman he married and the mother of his child was not who she claimed to be. The combined efforts of Social Security investigator Joe Villing and a nuclear physicist turned genealogist, Colleen Fitzpatrick, has revealed Lori Erica Ruff's real name was actually Kimberly McLean, effectively closing the Texas case, according to the Houston Chronicle. A DNA analysis, using a sample from Ruff's daughter, allowed investigators to trace the woman back to a Pennsylvania family whose daughter had vanished in 1986 when she was 17 years old, the newspaper reported. The family was able to positively identify Ruff as their daughter, who disappeared shortly after her mother remarried. They speculated she left because she did not get along with her new stepfather. Ruff's charade first began back in 1988 when she requested the birth certificate of a two-year-old girl who was killed in a house fire. She went on to assume the girl's name, Becky Sue Turner, for several months before moving to Idaho and legally changing her name to Lori Erica Kennedy. She eventually moved out to the Dallas area where she met and married Blake and in 2008, after multiple tries, the couple was able to have a daughter by way of in vitro fertilization. Ruff was extremely protective of her little girl, sometimes refusing to let her in-laws spend time alone with her. Her husband's family had always been a bit put off by her oddness and secretive nature, and in the end, the growing tension proved to be too much for Blake. In the summer of 2010 he moved out and filed for divorce after a bout of unsuccessful marriage counseling. This caused Lori to spiral, she began sending the Ruff family threatening emails and made it as difficult as possible to exchange custody of her daughter. On the morning of Christmas Eve that same year, Blake's father found her dead inside her car. She was 41 years old. After her funeral, the Ruffs began digging into Lori's past and eventually found a strong box which contained her Idaho ID reading Becky Sue Turner the copy of the birth certificate and scraps of paper. Until now, Lori Erica Ruff was known to authorities as Jane Doe, a woman of mystery who jumped from state to state, taking on the identities of other people. On Monday though, Lori Ruff's name was removed from the federal government's database of missing and unidentified persons. 8. The Grateful Doe Identified a man who died in a crash on a Virginia road in 1995 left few clues to his identity behind, a star tattoo on his arm, two Grateful Dead ticket stubs and a note addressed to someone named Jason. Online, the young man became known as Grateful Doe as composite images circulated last year. Thanks to some amateur detective work, he has now been identified as Jason Callahan, a 19-year-old from Myrtle Beach, SC. Officials in Virginia confirmed to the Associated Press on Thursday. Jason's name had been circulating among online communities of deadheads, as well as among online sleuths. The anonymous user Graymetal began circulating the composite on Imgur a year ago and posted an update after someone provided photos of a former roommate and Grateful Dead fan named Jason who looked very similar to the composite. The roommate didn't know Jason's last name. But the case was also helped along by people on Facebook, Reddit and Web Sleuths, a site dedicated to unsolved mysteries. A Grateful Doe Facebook page created in 2012 had drawn more than 13,000 followers who were interested in identifying the crash victim. On Reddit, more than 3,000 sleuths had joined a subreddit of the same name. 
many users circulated sketches and composites of Grateful Doe within online deadhead communities and local media outlets. Lesha Joannek, a 26-year-old Minnesota woman who operates several true crime Facebook pages, including the Grateful Doe page, said in an interview that Mr. Callahan's mother, Margreta Evans, contacted her on Facebook after hearing a local broadcast in Myrtle Beach. Miss Joannek said that she worked with the lawyer to verify that Miss Evans was actually Mr. Callahan's mother. Then, in January, Miss Evans filed a police report, saying that she had not heard from him since June 1995. The crash occurred that same month, when a Volkswagen van Mr. Callahan was traveling and crashed into two pine trees on a road near Emporia, VA. The driver of the van, Michael Eric Hager, 21, was thought to have fallen asleep at the wheel. Both the men died of head wounds, and Mr. Callahan's injuries rendered him unrecognizable. Based on the ticket stub information, the police believed that Mr. Callahan had seen a Grateful Dead show at RFK Stadium days before the crash. Both ticket stubs in his pocket were for that show. It was not clear that Mr. Callahan and Mr. Hager were among the many fans who followed the Grateful Dead from show to show in those years. Even so, deadheads have claimed Mr. Callahan and Mr. Hager as their own and offered their condolences. They died the same year the dead stopped touring, after Jerry Garcia, the lead guitarist and singer, died in August. Indeed, their van was not headed in the direction of the next show on the tour, in Michigan. The men were heading south. Mr. Callahan's mother told the police that her son was a frequent runaway, and that she had not known where to report him missing. No one ever thought to report him missing because they thought he wanted to be missing, his half-sister, Shannon Mitchelson, told the AP in the month since Mr. Callahan was identified as a possible match. Miss Joannek has served as an informal intermediary between the curious public and his relatives. I can't explain the feelings I get when talking to Jason's family, she wrote in April. I spent years trying to find the family of Grateful Doe, only to find that success is heartbreaking. Miss Joannek said that she believed the success of this case would help locate others who are missing. I am really stressing to news stations to please mention to people to check in on a loved one if you haven't heard from them in years or even a friend that just up and vanished, she said. A lot of families are split apart and some don't even know if their family member is missing if they didn't have contact. 7. Benjamin Kyle Learns His Real Name In 2004, a man in his 50s was found lying naked between two dumpsters behind a Burger King in Georgia. He had been hit three times in the head, and he couldn't remember his own name. He picked up the nickname BK and fleshed it out to Benjamin Kyle. Benjamin lived out the next decade of his life with no clue who he really was. Smore, a genetic genealogist, took the job of tracking Benjamin's past down, and she found out he'd been missing for a lot longer than 10 years. He ran away from his parents in 1976 and hadn't spoken to them since. Benjamin's real name hasn't been revealed because he wants to keep his privacy. He has, however, reunited with his family, which, Ironically, might never have happened if he'd never gotten amnesia. Orlando, Florida, the man who can't remember his past came to Orlando in search of a future. For more than a decade, he called himself Benjamin Kyle, because he didn't know his real name. It was like I was a ghost, he said Monday. Legally, I didn't exist. Kyle whose extraordinary ordeal has been featured by Dr. Phil McGraw's syndicated TV show, CNN and National Geographic, was diagnosed with retrograde amnesia 11 years ago when he was found unconscious behind a Burger King in Georgia. The cleaning woman who found him near the restaurant's dumpster told a dispatcher in Richmond Hill, Georgia, a suburb of Savannah, that she thought he was dead. He was naked and covered with fire ant bites. Police found nothing to identify him at the scene and called paramedics to take him away, figuring he was homeless. When he awoke, he couldn't help authorities solve the mystery. One of the only biographical facts he recalled was his birthday, he was exactly 10 years older than pop singer Michael Jackson. 
You see it in the movies, someone gets conked on the head and they forget everything. Oh, yeah, right, said Jacqueline Dowd, an attorney with a dignity, an Orlando organization that helps homeless and other low-income people get government-issued identification. But, in this case, it's true. We've seen the medical records that prove he does have that condition. Idignity invested more than two years helping Kyle collect documents needed to prove he wasn't a ghost. DNA testing, meanwhile, proved recently that he wasn't Benjamin Kyle either. While in the hospital, he had assumed the name Benjamin Kyle partly because the hospital staff had dubbed him BK Doe, for Burger King, and partly because he thought Benjamin sounded vaguely familiar, although it's usually spelled Benjamin. A YouTube documentary titled Finding Benjamin explores his rare condition, his quest for his identity and the struggle to live in the United States without a government ID. The film begins, Hello, my name is Benjamin Kyle. You don't know who I am and, quite frankly, neither do I. It also claims Kyle was the first U.S. citizen whose whereabouts were known, but who nonetheless was listed on the FBI's kidnapped and missing persons database. His fingerprints turned up no criminal record. In the 2012 documentary, Kyle said, It's pretty pathetic if no one's actually looking for someone that disappeared. Isn't there anyone important enough in your past life that would want to look for you? A genetic genealogist finally helped him learn his true identity. The method was similar to a process developed for adopted people who want to identify their birth families. The scientists' team compared Kyle's DNA to records and databases across the country to find clues. Kyle, 67, of Jacksonville, Florida, could have attained his state ID card anywhere in Florida, but chose Orlando because it's home to Idignity. The organization tracked down his birth certificate, original social security records and other documents, some of which had to be amended because the names on the paperwork did not match precisely, and they have to, Attorney Dowd said. To assemble the documentation necessary for a name he hasn't used in over 10 years took some doing, she said. Michael Dippy, Idignity's executive director, said government-issued identification is essential to American society. Kyle, for instance, could work only under the table, because he couldn't get a government-issued ID. Without it, you can't apply for a job, collect government benefits, sign a lease, enroll in school, get a library card, write a check, cash a check, and, in some places, you can't even stay at a homeless shelter, Dippy said. Kyle said he won't reveal his true identity until he meets with relatives in Indiana, his birth state. Some may have thought he was dead. He obtained his Florida ID card Monday, aided by Idignity, which paid the $31.50 state fee. The laminated card, which includes a hologram as a counterfeiting deterrent, features his picture, which he said looks terrible, and his birth name. Brenda Haynes, who processed Kyle's state ID, said almost everyone complains about his or her picture. Kyle described the ID card as a big turning point in his struggle and exclaimed, I now exist, and can prove it. He said he intends to have his social security number tattooed on his backside, as a precaution. If that's true, it's a good thing Kyle has a state ID card. Florida tattoo shops require customers to show ID. Kyle says he is not disclosing his name until he meets his relatives. 6. What happened on the Mary Celeste? In 1872, the crew of the Mary Celeste disappeared without a trace. Her story only got weirder from there. It's the stuff of maritime legend, a ship sighted in the distance, hailed without response, and boarded to reveal a vessel under full sail, its wheel creaking aimlessly, cabin doors slamming open and shut in the wind, and not a soul on board. On December 4, 1872, it actually happened. The Mary Celeste was discovered between the Azores and Portugal, her crew vanished without a trace of a struggle, the ship still fully provisioned. What calamity befell the ship remains a mystery. A final log entry, on November 24, showed no hint of distress. The cabin of Captain Benjamin Briggs was untouched, 
right down to the sewing machine and parlor militian belonging to his wife and infant daughter, the child's ghostly indentation remained visible on a bed. The crew must have left in a great hurry, reported the boarding party, for their pipes and tobacco were still there, and no sailor, they noted, willingly abandons ship without his pipe. Theories on the cause of the disappearance have ranged from cargo fumes to mutiny to, inevitably, alien abduction. The Mary Celeste's fate inspired fictional solutions in an Arthur Conan Doyle story, which blamed a race war, a 1935 Hammer horror film, a hook armed Bela Lugosi, and a Doctor Who episode, Daleks, of course. What's not as well known is that the Mary Celeste was also at the center of a second mystery. The disconcerting disappearance of its crew notwithstanding, the Mary Celeste still had plenty of life left in her, and soon went back into service. Thirteen years and seventeen hapless owners later, Mary was mostly infamous for being in poor shape and for losing money on runs from Boston to Africa and the West Indies. It was merely one final indignity when she wrecked off Haiti in January 1885, slamming squarely into Rochelos Reef, a known hazard. The ship didn't sink, but its hopelessly splintered remains would never leave the reef. Captain Gilman Parker declared the cursed ship a loss, and then went ashore to sell the salvage rights to a load of ale, cutlery, and shoes for $500. That's where the story might have ended except that police showed up at the captain's store in Boston three months later. The Mary Celeste, they charged, was a 280-ton, fully rigged insurance scam. The July 1885 trial of Captain Parker and the ship's co-owners, now buried in the Boston Globe archives, offers a fascinating glimpse into a gilded age flimflam. Laying out charts and totting up blackboard figures in a broiling Boston courtroom, Prosecutors revealed a chain of scams that reached from Haiti back to the alleyways of their own city. Captain Parker might have pulled it off, too, except that he'd gotten greedy, not content to rip off just his insurers, he also tried to con the local salvager and Haiti. The salvager hadn't found anything near the 125 casks of Basel promised on the ship's manifest, and the few he did locate weren't exactly good drinking. Called to the stand. A Boston bottler revealed they were moldy blanks with bass labels pasted to them, and filled with a large bottom of barrel runoff from smashed and leaking bottles. The bottler hadn't even bothered filling many of them, some were half full, some a third full, and some just enough to wet the bottle. The rest of the cargo was similarly suspect. The 975 barrels of New Fortune Herring? That was actually 780 barrels of rotten fish that stank so badly that one fish merchant said it was good only for fertilizers. Wooden barrels of fine butter proved to be rank slush. The Haiti-bound food cargo was so foul that one conspirator was overheard musing, if these n eat that fish and drink that beer, they will all be dead. A crate supposed to contain $1,000 in cutlery, when pried open revealed $50 worth of dog collars. Boxes of women's high-button boots were old galoshes. The ship and its cargo, covered by five insurers for a whopping $34,000, were hardly worth the kerosene necessary to burn the wreck. Captain Parker, in short, was in deep trouble. The defense lawyers were wild, one investigator later marveled of Parker's shambolic team. Parker's attorney cited famed Massachusetts eccentric Lord Timothy Dexter, a late 18th century merchant who supposedly shipped mittens and warming pans to the West Indies, to assert that the Mary Celeste's cargo belonged to a splendid tradition of crazy like a fox speculations. If the vulpine side of the simile was left unexplained, the crazy part was easy to spot. Haitians didn't typically buy new bass ale or salted herring let alone rotten beer and fish. They say the goods were overinsured. Suppose they were. It is a common thing to overinsure, sputtered Parker's attorney. And if the crew said the goods were worthless, well, everyone knew they liked to tell stories. Spinning a yarn is a sailor's phrase, he insisted. Perhaps yarn spinning could also explain the crew members who saw Captain Parker toss the ship's papers overboard, proclaiming they're gone. No one will know what's in them. 
and maybe it accounted for the first mate's claim that he dissuaded Parker from a plan to wreck by the more dangerous Turk silence, pleading, for God's sake don't pile her up there, we shall all be drowned. But it wasn't so easy for the defense to explain a letter in the captain's hand, dated two months after the wreck, which the first mate also produced, E. Boston, March 5th. 85 I would advise you not to know too much about cargo for the shippers have put in their bill of invoice to the adjusters and the protest and log book as that stand is all that I want. You will be called over to the insurance lookout you do not get in the wrong track by knowing too much. G.C. Parker after days of testimony, now it was the jury who knew too much. They had to decide whether Parker's plot deserved the conviction on the maritime charge of baratory deliberate destruction of a vessel, a crime then punishable by death. After counts and recounts, the jury returned with a shocker, they deadlocked, 7-5, with the majority in favor of conviction. The five holdouts, it seemed, just couldn't bring themselves to send a man to the gallows over rotten fish and bad butter. Three years later, and perhaps with the abandoned prosecution of Captain Parker in mind, a Massachusetts congressman worked to amend the Baratree law so that it would no longer be a capital offense. The penalty of death would be simply shocking, he admitted to a House committee. In many cases juries refused to convict, even when guilt was proved, as the only way to prevent a greater evil. But the doomed ship seemed to carry its own sentence, nearly everyone else indicted in the conspiracy went bust and Captain Parker died under obscure circumstances just three months after his trial. They might have taken heed of the fate of David Cartwright, a previous owner who had already lost a small fortune on the Mary Celeste. Of all the unlucky vessels I ever heard of, he would recall, she was the most unlucky. 5. Caledonia Jane Doe Identified a teenage girl found dead in an upstate New York field in 1979 has finally been identified. The Livingston County Sheriff's Office identified the girl as Tammy Jo Alexander, who was a teenager from Brooksville, Florida, according to a release on Monday from the department. Police are still investigating who killed Alexander and how she ended up in a field in the town of Caledonia, about 18 miles southwest of Rochester. Alexander was born in Atlanta, Georgia in 1963 and attended high school in Brooksville. She went missing from Brooksville sometime between 1977 and 1979, according to the Rochester Democrat and Chronicle. Her body was found after midnight on November 10, 1979, about half a mile from the highway. Police said Alexander was shot in the head with a .38 caliber handgun dragged into a cornfield and then shot in the back. Police investigated the murder, commonly called the Caledonia Jane Doe case, over the past 36 years. They interviewed thousands of leads worldwide, including convicted serial killers, the Democrat and Chronicle reports. Former Livingston County Sheriff John York told the Democrat and Chronicle in 1999 that heavy rain washed away much of evidence from the crime scene. Alexander was found with no identification on her. York said it was as if Alexander just dropped there from nowhere. Livingston County Sheriff Thomas Stockerty said the office worked with the Hernando County Sheriff's Office in Florida to follow up on new leads that emerged last year. A friend of Alexander filed a missing persons report, and police interviewed several family members. DNA results from one of Alexander's sisters confirmed the identity of the girl found 36 years ago. 4. Chelsea Brooks Murderer A man has been arrested almost two years after the naked body of a 22-year-old Michigan woman who went missing from a Halloween party was found. Chelsea Brock was last seen on October 26, 2014, in Frenchtown Township after going to a party while dressed as Poison Ivy. Witnesses at the time told police she had been seen about 3 a.m. in a parking lot with an unidentified man. Police announced on Friday a 27-year-old man Newport had been arrested, and that there was an open murder charge pending against him, NBC News reports. Investigators were able to make an arrest after receiving fresh information from the Michigan State Police Crime Lab that linked the man to the case. During the interview, 
Detectives obtained details that only the killer would have known, as this information had never been disseminated to the public, Monroe County Sheriff Dale Malone told reporters. The man is being held at Monroe County Jail and is expected to be arraigned Monday. The wife of Chelsea's brother Nathan posted on the Help Find Chelsea Brock Facebook page calling for people to respect the family's wishes and not name the suspect. It comes after police confirmed remains found on a 13-acre private property near a heavily wooded site close to train tracks in April 2015 were those of Chelsea Brock. The medical examiner's office in Wayne County used dental records to confirm the body is Brock's. Brock disappeared about 15 miles away from where her body was discovered Friday in Monroe County's Ash Township. She was dressed as the fictional comic villain at the party and was wearing a leaf-covered top and a dark purple wig. Her body wasn't clothed when workers found it while trying to free a dump truck from soggy soil. The poison ivy costume was found about 10 miles away at an industrial site near Flat Rock just weeks before her body was discovered. 3. Baby Hope Identified It was a cold case that had eluded investigators for more than two decades. A little girl with no name had been stuffed into a cooler and left beside a Manhattan highway. On Saturday, however, the mystery seemed to have been lifted with the arrest of a cousin of the girl, known as Baby Hope, the police said. And the girl's name had finally been restored, Angelico Castillo, who was born in Elmhurst Hospital Center in Queens in 1987 and was four years old when she died. The cousin, Conrado Juarez, 52, who lives on Richmond Plaza in the Bronx, was apprehended on Friday at the Greenwich Village restaurant where he worked, Police Commissioner Raymond W. Kelly said. On Saturday morning, Mr. Kelly added, Mr. Juarez confessed to sexually abusing and murdering the girl and, with the help of one of his sisters, putting the body in a picnic cooler and leaving it near the Henry Hudson Parkway in 1991. It was there. On July 23rd of that year, that construction workers discovered the remains. Detectives named her baby Hope as a symbol of their refusal to give up until they found her killer and gave her back her real name. Baby Hope identified as Angelica, but questions remain October 10, 2013 Police Department investigators and officials from the Manhattan District Attorney's Office who had dedicated more than two decades to the case met news of the arrest with a mixture of relief and solemn satisfaction. Many continued their efforts even as year after year hundreds of leads turned up nothing. Over the years the optimism was always there, except the frustration would grow said Deputy Chief Joseph J. Resnick, who was detective commander of the 34th Precinct in Washington Heights, where Angelica was found. But, you know what, reflecting back on what we named this little girl, Baby Hope, I think that's the most accurate name we could have come up with. And it worked. Mr. Kelly attributed the success to public outreach, forensic investigation and old-fashioned pavement pounding. Every year on the anniversary of Angelica's death, police officers would fan out across New York City, to post flyers, visit old addresses and talk to neighbors and relatives. Officers often visited the Bronx grave where detectives from the 34th Precinct buried the girl. On a headstone engraved with Baby Hope, there was also a plea for help. The identity of this little girl is still unknown, the words on the stone read. If you have any information, please call 1-800-577-TIPS. The tip that reignited the investigation came over the summer. The police were handing out flyers, tacking up posters and sending a van equipped with loudspeakers through Washington Heights in an effort to generate leads in the case. A woman came forward to share with the police the distant memory of a conversation she once had with another woman who had said her younger sister had been murdered. Detectives noted similarities to the Baby Hope case and tracked down the woman, who turned out to be a sister of Angelica. That led the police to Angelica's mother. They obtained an envelope that the mother had apparently licked to seal, enough to create the DNA profile, according to the office of the chief medical examiner. When it was compared to a DNA sample taken from the remains of Angelica, there was a match. From there, Detectives from the cold case squad built an extensive family tree leading them from Queens to the Bronx and to Mexico. 
They learned that Angelica's father was an immigrant from Mexico who had at one point moved to Queens. He had three daughters, including Angelica. At some point, the family split, and Angelica's father took custody of her and a sister, while her mother was left with the remaining daughter. At the time she was killed, Angelica was living in a home in Astoria, Queens, with several other relatives, including the sister of Mr. Juarez, Balvina Juarez Ramirez. On the day Angelica was killed, Mr. Juarez came to visit the home. He sexually assaulted her and then smothered her, Mr. Kelly said, citing Mr. Juarez's confession. After she was dead, Mr. Juarez summoned Miss Ramirez from another room. In his confession, Mr. Juarez said that it was Miss Ramirez who directed him to dispose of the body and brought him the cooler. The brother and sister hailed the livery cab, and traveled with the body to Manhattan. There, in a wooded area near the Dickman Street exit off the Henry Hudson Parkway, they left the cooler containing Angelica's body. Juarez returned to the Bronx and his sister to Queens, never to speak of the heinous act again until the NYPD investigators through their relentless investigation caught up with Juarez, Mr. Kelly said, adding that Ms. Ramirez had since died. Mr. Juarez was arraigned late Saturday night and charged with murder. He pleaded not guilty. No bail was set. A law enforcement official, who requested anonymity because the inquiry was continuing, said investigators believed that Ms. Ramirez had been involved in the abuse of other children, both with and apart from Mr. Juarez. The official added that the case would most likely not have been solved without the assistance of other relatives of Mr. Juarez. The reactivated case eventually led detectives to Mr. Juarez's apartment. Mr. Kelly said that his daughter told them that her father had been in Mexico for the last 12 years. Detectives were able to interview Juarez's wife, who resided at that same address, Mr. Kelly said. She informed them that in fact, he had gone to work at 7 a.m. Friday morning, at a job in Manhattan. Investigators met him near the restaurant where he is employed and convinced him to talk with them. On Saturday night, a manager at Trattoria Pest Pasta on Bleecker Street confirmed that Mr. Juarez worked there, but would not say more. Mr. Juarez, a petite man with a thick dark mustache, wore a white shirt and navy blue pants when he arrived at Manhattan Criminal Court. 2. The Cause of Raoul Wallenberg's Death Raoul Wallenberg is a hero. He was a Swedish businessman who saved more than 100,000 Jewish lives during World War II. Wallenberg made fake papers for the Jews to help them escape and was repaid for his trouble by being thrown into a Soviet prison camp. Wallenberg died in 1947, but how it happened has always been disputed. The Soviets claim he had a heart attack, but many doubt that they're telling the truth. In June 2016, the diaries of KGB head Ivan Serov were published. Inside, he writes, I have no doubts that Wallenberg was liquidated in 1947. He further claims that Wallenberg was killed on orders directly from Stalin and Molotov. The diary entry isn't entirely conclusive, but it makes it clear that the KGB didn't believe that Wallenberg died by accident. Even within the highest ranks, it was accepted that Stalin had him killed. The mystery surrounding the disappearance and death of Raoul Wallenberg, the Swedish diplomat who saved tens of thousands of Hungarian Jews during the Holocaust, has returned to the headlines with the recent publication of Soviet general and first KGB head Ivan Serov's diaries, which may provide a solution to the affair. Behind the diaries publication is Vera Serova, the KGB chairman's only grandchild. Four years ago, Serova, a retired ballet dancer, wanted to renovate her grandfather's Moscow dacha, which she inherited. The workmen found the journals and suitcases hidden inside the garage wall. They were disappointed that the treasure turned out not to be money or jewels but only papers. The book, Notes from a Suitcase, Secret Diaries of the First KGB Chairman, found over 25 years after his death, was published in Russia in June. I have no doubts that Wallenberg was liquidated in 1947, the ex-head of the former Russian secret police and intelligence agency writes in his diaries.
Wallenberg was killed in a Soviet prison and Serov quotes his predecessor, Viktor Abakimov, as saying the order to kill Wallenberg came from the top, Joseph Stalin and then Foreign Minister Vyacheslav Molotov. What has been previously reported is that Wallenberg died in a Soviet prison in 1947. Now for the first time there is a record of a senior official with access to the relevant information saying he did not die a natural death, most likely from a heart attack or heart failure as the Soviet government had stated, but was murdered. And yet, it is still not clear why he was killed. Wallenberg, a Swedish businessman born in 1912, was sent by the Swedish Foreign Ministry as its special envoy to Budapest in the summer of 1944 with the goal of saving the approximately 230,000 remaining Jews from the gas chambers. By then, the Nazis had already deported over 400,000 Jews, almost all of them to Auschwitz-Birkenau. To help the Jews survive, Wallenberg and fellow Swedish diplomat Peranger issued thousands of protective passports identifying the owners as Swedish subjects and providing a certain amount of protection from deportation. They also rented 32 buildings in the city, which they declared Swedish diplomatic institutions and where they hid some 10,000 people. At a risk to his own life, Wallenberg himself rescued Jews from trains heading to the concentration camps. After the Russians had liberated Hungary from the Germans in May 1945, he was arrested by the Soviet forces, most likely because he was suspected of being a spy, either for the Germans or the United States. The Yad Vashem Holocaust Remembrance Center in Jerusalem declared him a righteous among the nations in 1963. Over the years, his disappearance at the hands of the Soviets made him one of the most famous righteous Gentiles of World War II, as did the Russian refusal to clear up the circumstances of his disappearance and death. In 1957, the Soviets said he had died in prison due to heart problems ten years earlier. In 1991, after the fall of communism and the Soviet Union, a joint Swedish and Russian inquiry commission was established to look into the matter. However, the report, published in 2000, did not provide any new information, claiming that all documents relating to Wallenberg had either disappeared or been intentionally altered. Serov, who died of a heart attack in 1990 at age 84, wrote in his diaries that he had examined the Wallenberg file, the Soviets have always denied that such a file existed and found evidence that Wallenberg's body was cremated after his death, in the form of a document signed by two officials of the Lubyanka prison in 1947 testifying to the cremation. Abakimov, a general and the Minister of State Security at the time, was arrested in 1951 and executed for treason in 1954. It seems Abakimov presumably said during his interrogation, when Serov was KGB chairman, that Stalin and Molotov had ordered Wallenberg's death. An article about the new book published last week in the New York Times quoted Russian historian Nikita Petrov, an expert on the Stalinist era and also on Serov, as saying the word killed has never appeared in any official Soviet document concerning Wallenberg. They did not use this word, Petrov stated. They said it appears he was killed, but we know nothing about this, we don't have any documents. In Serov's diary, you can find this word as a fact. The diaries were edited and condensed into a single 632-page volume, and its publication coincided with a small exhibition on Serov at the Russian Military Historical Society. Serov told the Times that part of her goal was to restore her grandfather's reputation. Wallenberg's niece, Marie Dupuy, published a response on her website, searching for Raoul Wallenberg. She called on the Russian Federal Security Service archives to present this documentation, which has not been made available to us during previous investigations of the Wallenberg case. But she called in to doubt the reliability of some of what Serov had written, saying the original diaries must be thoroughly evaluated. Apostrophe Serov's notes include a number of factual errors which cast some doubt on the reliability of at least part of his recollections, wrote the Pui. 1. Paul Franchak's True Identity In 1965, the Franzucks were reunited with a child they thought was their own. Their baby, Paul, 
had been abducted, so when they heard that a toddler had been found abandoned in a stroller, they were sure it was their boy. They took him and raised him as their own. As the baby grew, though, he looked less and less and like the Franzax. In 2012, the family took a DNA test and found out that the child they'd raised wasn't their flesh and blood. It's more, yes, the saints who helped Benjamin Kyle, help Paul track down his real identity. She found out that his birth name was Jack. His biological parents had since died, but he had a twin sister named Jill. Jack and Jill both vanished before their second birthdays, and Jill was still missing. Sis's discovery led to more questions, no one knows what became of Jill or Paul, why Jack was left in a stroller, or who was behind all these abductions. Jack, at least, finally knows where he came from. In 2012, Paul Franchak of Henderson figured out that he really wasn't the person he always believed himself to be. After George Knapp and the I team first broke the story a few years ago, it's received news coverage all over the world, but the search for truth has been stymied. Now, thanks to the expertise of some dedicated DNA detectives, Franchak finally knows who he is, but along with the answers came new questions and a darker mystery. Franchak knows his family name and he knows where and when he was born. I do. It's pretty crazy, he said. Crazy doesn't begin to describe it. His name has been Paul Franchak for as long as he can remember, but now he knows the truth. The news came days ago in a phone call from genetic genealogist Moore. She's like, how you doing? I said, I'm okay. She goes, what do you think of the name Jack? I said that's a good name. That's strong. She said, that's your name. And I was just blown away, Franchak recounts. But there were more surprises to come, not all of them pleasant. The Franchak saga began in 1964 when a son was born to Dora and Chester Franchak at a hospital in Chicago. A day later, a woman dressed as a nurse kidnapped the baby, setting off a nationwide manhunter and media frenzy. More than a year later, a child was found abandoned on the streets of Newark, NJ. The boy was assigned the name Scott McKinley. The FBI thought it might be the missing Franchak baby. Eventually the Franzucks adopted the boy in the belief he was Paul. He was brought up in a loving family but always suspected he did not fit in. In October of 2012, while living in Henderson, Paul used a home DNA kit to confirm that he was not a Franchak. He asked the I-team for help. The news reports generated hundreds of tips and leads to a website and Facebook page, and a new media stampede began. The I-team story was reported all over the world, including by CBS News, and later by the ABC Network. The FBI agreed to reopen the kidnapping case, but has done little if any follow-up. Paul to get help from an unexpected source. He has been on the phone daily with Moore. She is the founder of the DNA Detectives. The company which has taken the point on the Franchak case. My team and I have worked on this case every single day for the last year and a half. It might have been just a few emails per day or 18 hours a day. It's been an incredibly long road with unbelievable twists and turns, Moore said. Moore and her team scoured all three of the major DNA data banks, including Ancestry.com, to look for a genetic match. A company named Family 3 DNA donated free genetic test kits so the team could pursue numerous leads. Most of them fizzled. But a possible match found six months ago led to the East Coast. Team members cracked the puzzle days ago by building a time machine in a way. Apostrophe. Then examined their family trees, building their ancestors forward in time, looking for descendants who were in the right place at the right time to be connected to the person whose family we are searching for, explains Moore. Public records confirmed that Paul's name at birth was Jack. He was one of five children. His parents are both deceased. Two siblings are still alive. But here's the real shocker. I also found out I have a twin sister. My name is Jack. My twin sister's name is Jill. She's missing Franchak said. We have no record of what happened to her. 
Our research indicates that both her and I mysteriously disappeared before our second birthdays. I was found abandoned in Newark and we have nothing on Jill, he added. Paul is not yet releasing the family name. He wants to protect the family's privacy and he needs time to piece together the larger picture. The relatives he has contacted so far have told him dark tales about his parents. His birth father allegedly warned family members to never mention the twins. Both sides of the family were told that the other family had the twins. So no one knew that the twins were missing. Some of the family had no clue that the twins ever existed, Franchak said. He was told that in one family photo album, a page devoted to the twins was literally ripped out. Birth records exist for his sister Jill, but no death certificate. It's one thing to learn who you are, but like I said, it's bittersweet because, I have a twin sister out there that vanished just like I did. What happened to her, you know? One scenario being explored is that Paul's sister might have met with foul play and her death was covered up. And there is also the other mystery, what became of the biological Paul Franchak, the baby kidnapped from the Chicago hospital. That's the question that started Franchak down this path.